The next speaker, uh, Jerome Petri. Uh, so, please. Doesn't move. Okay. okay, so here I will present you a um, talk about the geometry of the magnetic field because probably one of the problems to distinguish between different kinds of neutron star is the topology of the magnetic field. And usually what people do to uh, compute neutron star magnetospheres to assume that they, the, <clears throat> there is a dipolar field which is exactly centered with respect to the center of the neutron star. So here I will show you that we can extend uh, such kind of picture by using an off-centered dipole. So you have the center of your star and you push a bit, you translate your dipole with respect to the center of the star. So this talk is a bit uh, theoretical. I will show you how we can compute exactly such kind of solution analytic, analytically. And the next talk by Anu, will show you uh, some consequences for pulsar emission from radio up to uh, very high energy. Uh, I cannot switch to the next uh, slide. Okay, yeah, thanks. So the first, this is the outline of my, my talk, and the simple question is, uh, what will happen if you have, a, let's say, a magnetic dipole in vacuum, which is for simplicity, uh, simplicity let's assume that you have a, a star, or whatever, a sphere, a perfect sphere, with a per perfect conductor in it, and you push your dipole at any place with, uh, within this uh, neutron star or gen more generally this sphere. So in this case, we have a geometry which is what I call an off-centered dipole. So we know already the solution if the center or if the dipole coincides exactly with the center of the star, then we have the Deutsch solution of 1955. But if you take a more general com configuration by offsetting your dipole with respect to the center of the star, you get a more general solution with, of course, also more parameters, but you can find an exact solution which is described in uh, this two uh, paper from 2015 and 16. So of course we wanted to check if such kind of assumption is realistic, if we could see it in some data, and this will probably be possible if we look at phase resolved polarization, let's say for instance uh, in radio, because if you have a coincidence between the dipolar location and the center of the star, you get the rotating vector model, which shows the evolution of the polarization angle with phase of the neutron star. But if you take the off-centered model, you get a different shape, which is not necessarily an S shape, as I will show it at the end of my talk. And I'll call this the decentered rotating vector model. And of course, if you, to, to get even better constraint, we could look for multi-wavelengths uh, like curve fitting uh, in pulsar going from radio to high energy. And this will be the talk given by, the next talk given by Anu. So how can we compute exactly uh, this solution? So there is a bit of mathematics here, but uh, the equations itself are not so important here. There are just a few things uh, you should know. So to find these solutions, we are looking, the first assumption is that we are looking for stationary solution, which means that the neutron star magnetosphere is perfectly rotating uh, at a solid body rotation equal to omega. 
And in vacuum, in spherical geometry, you can decompose uh, any electromagnetic field uh, into a series of multipoles. And the simple one usually everybody uses is the dipole, so L equal 1 and M equal 0 or 1. So here I do use a general, very general multipole expansion, which can be done <coughs> with uh, spherical harmonics, which are depicted in this uh, picture here. So if you go to higher multipoles, you can describe a uh, smaller and smaller uh, magnetic field structure. So and, uh, what's also very interesting in vacuum for the Maxwell solution, you can show that once you fix only the radial component of the magnetic field uh, at the surface of your sphere, the whole solution in vacuum outside your neutron star is completely and uniquely determined by a linear combination of uh, this multipolar solution. So you just need to fix the radial component of the magnetic field at the surface, and then you have your whole solution uh, in vacuum. So that's the idea I show here. So just some a question, what is also very uh, efficient is to decompose the electric and the magnetic field into vector spherical harmonics. And in this way, you can also show that they are exactly divergence-lessness, which means that the divergence of B and D is equal to zero, which should be the case in vacuum. And so we have uh, uh, quantities that are perfectly determined in black, and the <clears throat> constant we have to, to find here for any special solution of Maxwell equation as a, con a number given in red and blue here, the AD and the AB. So this is, these are the constant of in integration which depends on the boundary condition at the stellar surface. So at infinity, we can also impose outgoing wave solutions by taking what is called spherical Hankel functions, which are very well known in mathematical physics. So this as this function here, so we are sure that we are only uh, dealing with outgoing waves, there is nothing coming from infinity and hitting the neutron star. So now what we have to do to finish, uh, to find our solution for any magnetic field configuration is to compute this constant of integration. And this can be done, as I said already, just by expanding the radial component of the magnetic field into spherical harmonics and the only thing you have to compute here as a term in red, which I called FB, LM, uh, depending on R. And once you put this into Maxwell equation with this expansion, you can show by some uh, computation analytically that your constant of integration are given first by this one, AB, something depending on FB. For non axisymmetric case, for the axisymmetric case, you have AB given by a simpler function here which is polynomial in R, here is a Hankel function. And you can do the same thing for the AD coefficient, which are a bit more complicated to compute for the electric field, but they depend also only on the expansion of your radial component of the magnetic field for the non axisymmetric case and for the axisymmetric case. So you see that your solution is indeed completely determined by the expansion coefficient of the radial field uh, at the surface so starting with this expression here, you have your full solution. Okay, so you can use your preferred uh, magnetic field topology at the surface, and then deduce BR, the component FB in red here, and then you get your, your solution in, in vacuum, stationary and outgoing wave. So just to put this uh, into, uh, <clears throat> in pictures for the, a uh, rotating dipole, we find the Deutsch solution for a perpendicular dipole, so it's very well known, you see the spiral structure. And for a quadrupole, which I call a perpendicular one, which means L is equal to two and M equal to two, you get also a spiral structure, but with, now with four arms. And if you want to get a, a general configuration, you could make a combination with a given weights between the dipole and the quadrupole. And this is the thing, I will use to compute an off-centered dipole. So you can do, make a combination of any of this uh, magnetic topology to get your full solution. So already some, uh, some interesting things about uh, adding multipolar field is that 
I should remind you because yesterday we saw that people estimate the magnetic field strength at the surface with uh, luminosity, spin down luminosity. Uh, be careful because you will only get the dipolar component uh, of the magnetic field. Why? Because uh, for any multipole, luminosity is given by uh, this expression here, which depends on the strength of your magnetic field, of course, on the spin, uh, on the spin down, and on the radius of your neutron star. So you see that depending on the multipole, dipole, quadrupole, dependence with spin down will change, and you can, with this expression, derive the breaking index, which is then given by n equal to l plus one. So depending on, uh, on the multipole you, you consider, or if you have a combination of multipoles, your breaking index can be very different from, from three, and more importantly, you could have a quadrupolar strength which is uh, larger than the dipolar strength, but still a spin down which is completely dominated by the dipole. So this means just by looking at the spin down, you completely miss uh, the quadrupolar strength in your magnetic field estimate. So I don't believe that the square root of PP dot will give you uh, reliable strengths of the magnetic field strengths at the surface. So be aware of this. Just then, for example, for a dipole indeed, you get n equal three. If you take a pure quadrupole, you would get n equal five, which is the same as for gravitational radiation because gravitational waves, lowest order is also quadrupolar. And if you would take a monopole, which is l equal one, kind of particle wind, you could go down to n equal one. So indeed, uh, when you look at observation of breaking index, we had already some talks showing such kind of value yesterday, we find mostly breaking index between one and three, let's say. So this maybe gives you a hint that uh, <clears throat> the neutron star magnetosphere, the pulsar magnetosphere should be a kind of combination between a monopolar wind, uh, very far outside the light cylinder, and the dipolar structure, which is what is expected or assumed close to the neutron star surface. But there is one uh, challenging number here which gives n more than three, and in this case, maybe just a simple assumption, you could say that it's the combination between a, a dipole and a quadrupole, because then you should expect to have a breaking index which is between three and five. Okay, so now some uh, solution for what is of interest here is the off-center dipole. So what is important to understand is the magnetic topology here. It's a bit more complicated than a centered dipole, of course. So the question is also why should we study such kind of general configuration? Well, uh, I can hardly b believe that a dipolar field uh, inside the neutron star is exactly at the center. It's too, too simplistic. Uh, um, assumption and probably also inside it's not a, a pure dipole. Uh, if you look at some other branch of uh, astrophysics in main second star, people quite often use multipoles or better off-center dipole to explain a polarization profile. Uh, so why should we not use such kind of model also uh, for neutron stars? So this is what I've done here. There are two important uh, vectors to describe the geometry of your, of your problem. The first one is, of course, the magnetic moment orientation. This is something uh, easy to understand. The second one is a displacement vector, which I call D, which is a displacement with respect to the center of the star. So it gives you the location of this magnetic moment uh, with respect to the center of your star. So if you put this uh, configuration to compute the magnetic field, the static component of the magnetic field. Any text, in any textbooks, you, you can find the, the expression. You just have to change uh, the radius r by r minus d because you have shifted your, your magnetic moment with respect to the center of your coordinate system. So you get this for the static uh, magnetic field. You can compute the radial component at the stellar surface because you assume that inside it's a static dipole just rotating with, uh, with the star. So you can compute BR. Once you have BR, you can compute your, the expansion 
uh, with this coefficient here. And so you have your solution outside. And this is what is done here. So just to remind you the, the geometry, you have your coordinate system x, y, z, uh, star is rotating, magnetic moment is in blue here, with a given orientation given by the unit vector mu, proportional to the magnetic moment m. Everything is rotating at a constant rate uh, omega. You have the displacement vector d, the center of the star is here, and the magnetic moment is located here. And you can describe this with some other parameters, alpha and beta. Beta for the centered dipole has no, no meaning. You could take zero. But here for a north-centered one, you have to take into account this kind of phase shift. And if you want to go to some op observational signature, you have to add two other parameters. The first one is the inclination of the line of sight uh, in green here and the emission height, because the property of emission here will depend also on the emission height. So we compute the solution as a series of uh, centered multipoles. So the off-centered dipole is seen as a series, an infinite series of centered multipoles. So what I show you here is just the expansion to first order correction, which is a quadrupolar term. So F1, 0, and F11, is the usual centered oblique dipole, which gives you the Deutsch solution. And the first order correction, F20, F21, and F22, is a quadrupolar correction in epsilon, where epsilon is a displacement normalized to the Newton star radius, which should, of course, be less than one, because your dipole should remain inside the star. And so you can actually show that uh, Zero's order, so the zero's order is the pure dipole. It does not depend on epsilon. First order correction depends on epsilon to the power one, and it adds quadrupolar term in your expansion. If you go to higher order, epsilon squared, so if the off-centered is pretty large, you have to add a higher order multipolar correction, hexapolar one, uh, octupolar one, etc. So here for simplicity, I just keep the first order correction, which means that uh, you should keep epsilon much less than one. So if you put this off-centered dipole into rotation, uh, you have to then use your zeros order approximation with the, the dipolar solution. F can be any of the electromagnetic field component D or B. So this is Deutsch solution, dipolar with some phase shift, because now for a north-centered dipole is important. And then you have to add the multipolar component here, just adding the quadrupolar axis symmetric term, the m equal one term, and the m equal two term, neglecting higher order multipolar term in epsilon squared, and so on. So again, just to remind you, here I will make some combination between the Deutsch solution dipole here and quadrupole to get an idea of the geometry of a north-centered rotating dipole. So what can we do then with the solution? We can compute some uh, uh, interesting con quantities. The first one is a uh, topology of the magnetic field. Here in red, uh, you can see the uh, off-centered dipole, and in blue, uh, the centered one. So of course, I, I up applied a, sh a shift of 20% of my dipole here for the off-centered case. So when you are very far away here, if you zo would zoom in, you would also see a shift in the spiral structure compared to, uh, to the Deutsch solution. And indeed, if you zoom into the magnetosphere, you see here a sh small shift between uh, uh, the centered case in blue and the off-centered case, which is completely moved to, uh, to the right here. So this could have some important consequences for pulsar emission, especially for photons coming close to, uh, to the neutron star surface because you shift your whole geometry to one direction. So that's one special case in which you can even see the imprint of the off-centering uh, very far away outside the light cylinder because the shift remains here. I show you here a second case in which if you make a zoom here, uh, there, is no, uh, there is no shift uh, outside, but still it remains inside the neutron star. So the, here there is a kind of evanescence of uh, the off-centering 
with respect to, uh, to, to the centering. You cannot see it very far away. You have to look deep inside to see the off-centering in this second case. Okay, so the other thing you can compute is the spin-down luminosity. So you will, of, get, of course, get some corrections with respect to a centered dipole. So the blue term here is the one you should get for the Deutsch solution in cor correction corresponding to the parameter A, which is a neutron star radius of a light cylinder radius here. You can compute also spin down luminosity part coming from an M equal to mode because it's quadrupolar and you see that correction are pretty weak because they scale with A squared and epsilon squared. And another interesting thing which leads this guy 40 years ago to study the off-centered dipole is because in this case you can show that the neutron star will get a kick. And so the idea in this paper was to explain uh, acceleration or boost uh, of the neutron star to, uh, to high velocity, hundreds of kilometers per, per second, by this kind of electromagnetic re recoil uh, of the neutron star. So we can compute it also here. Of course, if there is no uh, off-centering, this force is completely equal to zero because epsilon is equal to zero. So implication for pulsed emission uh, usually, we have different favorite place to have uh, emission, polar cap, slot gap, and outer gap. This is a picture for a centering dipole. And so uh, I will not speak about it because in the next talk, uh, Anu will show some implication of off-centering all this geometry to look for the polar cap geometry, for the radio pulse profile, and for the high energy pulse profile. So just what I want to do to, to finish here with my last slide is to check for polarization property of an off-centering dipole. Of course, here I have much more parameters than the, in the rotating vector model. You just have inclination of line of sight and inclination of the magnetic moment. Here I have much more parameters, but still I'm able to find the exact analytical expression for the polarization angle, tangent, psi here, depending on the direction of the, the observer, n here, depending on, on another vector here, and on the rotation vector. So all these quantities can be computed. You see the expression are a bit longish, but still they are analytical just with cosinus and sinus. You have in, uh, inclination of line of sight, you have parameter alpha, beta, uh, delta, etc. And of course, if there is no off-centering epsilon equals zero, you can check that you get exactly the rotating vector expression of Radhakrishnan and Cook. So that's, of course, constant. But if epsilon is different from zero, you see that this expression is altitude dependent. So uh, compared to the rotating, traditional rotating vector model here, which is independent of altitude, if you off-center your, your dipole, you get a polarization profile evolution which also depends on altitude. So in this way, we have a, way, uh, a mean to get maybe information also on the altitude just by looking at the polarization angle profile uh, at different frequencies. And so I show the difference uh, here uh, on the plot to the right, here to the lower right part, for instance, here, uh, the blue curve is a rotating vector model. And you, if you have an off-centering case, you see that the transition here or the, uh, is more smooth in the polarization profile. X coordinate is phase, Y coordinate, Y coordinate is a polarization angle, and you clearly see, for instance, in the middle panel, a big change between the traditional rotating vector model in blue here and the off-centering case, which show a much more complicated uh, polarization angle profile. So such kind of observation could maybe constrain uh, the off-centering geometry and show that it could better fit some polarization data with respect to the rotating vector model. So just to finish, I showed you that uh, we can uh, naturally uh, find a multipolar component if we assume an off-centered rot rotating dipole. And the strengths of the multipolar component are completely determined by the geometry of your off-centering. Uh, you should also remember that multipoles, because they are also radiating uh, 
uh, they decay like one over the distance as for the dipole. So in principle, you could even see them at very large distance. So maybe there is also a signature of the off-centering dipole in the striped wind, so very far away outside the light cylinder. And we hope maybe to see a clear signature of this off-centering in uh, polarization uh, profiles. Uh, to, to extend this, of course, the vacuum solution is too simplistic. We should do at least force free or plasma MHD or peak simulation to get more realistic uh, solution of it. But anyway, it's already a, a good start. And we want also to do multi wavelength analysis to re explore the lag between the radio and the gamma ray pulse profile as seen by uh, Fermi. Glad. Okay, thank you. Question, please. Uh, so, uh, did you try to uh, compare your results with uh, real swings of position angles? I mean, here, such kind of plots here to to compare with uh, real data. Well, what we need is to have uh, data with single pulse profile polarization, because if you use, uh, usually what, what is given is polarization profile, which are average over many pulses. But the problem is that we have orthogonal polarization modes, and uh, if you make average between this polarization mode, you get kind of artifact of uh, polarization angle evolution because of making an average between two orthogonal, orthogonal polarization modes. So, uh, to, to really compare with data, we need uh, to look for very bright pulsar in radio for which we have single pulse polarization profile. And so I'm in contact with some people to see if they can have some data. Uh, Jerome, in your modified Deutsch model solution, how does the mean polar cap size depend on your expansion parameter epsilon? The mean polar cap? Cap size. When you uh, trace the, the cap size, points yes. back to the polar cap. Okay. Um, yes. I will. I don't have plots here, but in the next talk you, you will see it. So what will happen with uh, uh, the off-centering? It de depends a bit. In some case, you just see a shift. No change in the polar cap shape or size, but just a shift okay. a bit to, to the left or to the right. And in some other cases, uh, you can have a, an increase in the shape or a, a decrease. So it depends a bit on, yeah. well, if one polar cap is increasing, the other one is decreasing and also shifting mm -hmm. a bit. Right. You will see it in the next talk by, uh, by okay. Anu. Okay, thank you.